Hello, everybody, and welcome to the March edition of the Q&A webinar for the Hitmakers Club. We have a lot of really great questions this time, actually more than usual. But don't forget that I will answer any of your questions. Just put them over on the right on the chat. And actually, uh, just to make sure that you're hearing me and seeing everything, just tell me over on the chat as well, as well as uh, who you are, where you're from. Okay, I see uh, Ron is here from Pelham, New Hampshire. Ray from New Zealand. Wow, coming a long way. Uh, John is here. Hey, everybody. So, um, as usual, ask your questions on the right. We're going to get to some questions that were sent in beforehand. And a lot of this comes from either comments that were made or questions that were sent directly to me via email. There's always number a number of them that I get that nobody sees that are pretty interesting, and that's why I try I tried to include them. Aaron's here. Hello, Aaron. John from Peoria. Very cool. So here we go. Here's one from Aaron, actually. Uh, I have a few questions regarding reverb and delay. I think I answered your question when I sent you an email back, but I'll go into more detail now because it's easier for me to talk about it than it is to write about it, at least in the limited amount of time that I usually have to write. Okay, number one, should I put reverb and delay in all tracks? If so, is it better to put it on group tracks? Uh, no, generally not. Now, that being said, sometimes there is one reverb that you use kind of as a glue that might go on... I don't want to say all the tracks, but the majority of them. Now, I'm saying sometimes. And some mixers like to do that and put just a little bit, and I mean a tiny bit, just so much. It, it's so tiny that you can barely hear it, and that kind of ties everything together. But there are other mixers that don't like to do that at all. So it, it's usually no, you don't want to do that. But sometimes you, you might but usually it's a long reverb and it's the type that blends in with the track that doesn't jump out because if it's too prominent it's not going to work everything's going to sound washed out and that's not what you want okay number two should i only put it on the stereo mix so that the reverb and delay are on the whole song no and again this kind of it's counterproductive. Even if you were going to put it on each track, they would each get different amounts. Because again, you kind of want it so, and I'm talking about one reverb that works as a glue. Uh, there are some cases where you want things pushed back in the track, so they require more reverb, and sometimes you want them closer to you feeling like they're closer to you so there's less reverb and many times there's different types of re reverb that you'd be using you might be using two or three different types of reverb or two or th three different reverbs completely different reverbs on a track or more uh okay number three should i use reverb and delay on tracks with things like synths uh some digital audio workstation sounds already have reverb and delay on them uh so it seemed repetitive to add them to the mix well, you're usually better off to, if you can turn it off, on the, in other words, if you're using like a sample or something and you can go in and turn it off, you're better off to do that and put your own reverb on that fits the track better. If you can't do that, you listen carefully, and if it fits in the track, great. And if it doesn't, then put a little bit of reverb on delay that, you, that does fit in and see if that works. But don't be afraid to use some additional reverb if what's on there isn't to your liking. Okay, hope I helped Aaron with that. Okay, from Don, Don Naffy. Please pardon my newbie questions or question about the MMA, Music Modernization Act, and that's the act that just passed um, a few months ago. Um, are the, but are the royalties being collected for producers and engineers in addition to those collected for artists or part of the artist's payout? 
Uh, there seems to be some ambiguity on this. Okay, here's the way this works. Producers w can get paid. Now, before the Mon Music Modernization Act, what would happen to pay producers? The artists would collect the money and then would pay a percentage directly. So, in other words, the artist would have to collect the money first and then they, they'd give the producer uh, some money. Now, that's one thing if you have an artist that you can depend on or an artist accountant, for instance, or financial manager. Uh, that's one thing. That always doesn't work out in a producer's favor or an engineer's favor, even though you may negotiate that deal. So the Music Modernization Act has a provision in it called the AMP Act, and what that will do is that will actually pay the producer directly. And so, in other words, the artist still has to designate it, still has to okay it, because it doesn't automatically happen. So you don't automatically get 5%. Basically, the artist says, yes, this is okay, and then the money gets paid directly to you. So it's a little bit of both in that once the artist signs off on it, then you're getting paid directly from from royalties. As the artist gets paid, so do you. And that's the way that works, Don. Oh, I see a few more have come in. Michael Jones is here. Brian from Wisconsin. Hello, hello. Okay, here's one from David Hill. Can you tell which services provide a one-off all distribution model? I think Spotify Prime does this, but I'm researching what else does it. That is, sign up and get dis distribu get distributed across, say, the top six streaming services. Okay, so obviously you can do this from CD Baby and TuneCore and DistroKid and Ditto Music and tons of others. Uh, they're called aggregators, and, and they basically will do all that for you. However, there are some services that are now including this. Spotify is the first one. Spotify did a deal with DistroKid, and now and I think they actually bought into DistroKid as well. So now if you sign, if you upload one of your tracks to Spotify, you can also designate it to go to all of the other streaming networks as well. The same thing with SoundCloud. I forget who they they have their deal with but it's the same thing you can upload the soundcloud and then it's some you know you're going to pay extra for this but it's not that much and and then you'll basically say yes distribute it to all the other streaming services as well there are quite a number it's not like the top six there's 24 i think that most services like this will actually distribute to so that's the good part you can get a little bit of money coming from a lot of different places and it all adds up. So that's kind of like we, why we like to do that. But uh, yeah, there are several now and I suspect we'll see more and more of this in the future. Okay. From Gene Resnick. I just finished my home studio. Some of the guys are telling me the first I should put a directional mic up. An all directional mic. I guess you mean an Omni mic to determine problem frequencies of the room. Once I find them and remove them, the setup is good for all recording later. Should, uh, could you tell me if that's the right thing to do, if there's some trustworthy materials I can read about? Okay, um, this is what's known as room tuning. And usually it's done with a, well, traditionally it was done with a one-third octave graphic equal, equalizer in the monitor chain. In other words, it's right before the speakers. And the whole trick on this is uh, getting somebody with a lot of experience that will take not just one measurement, but lots of measurements. I mean, dozens of measurements in the room. And then figuring out from that where the problem frequencies are. <coughs> so, no, you can't just put one Omni mic up and make this work, or at least it won't work well. I mean, the whole idea is maybe you can put one wherever your listening position is, and that will sound good there. But then what happens is you can't move. You move like this, and, and it all goes away. So that 
that's why that doesn't work. Now there are packages, software packages that you can now buy. Uh, several of them. There's uh, gee, I think I have one on my shelf or a couple on my shelf here, um, which I'm not seeing. One from IK Multimedia. Um, Sonovox, I think, is another one. And you bet it, this all happens in software in your computer. But again, you have to take the measurements, and the more measurements you take, the better. Personally, I've never found them to be helpful to me. Now, I know a lot of people that, that swear by these various programs and think it's just the best thing and really helps them. It hasn't for me. And I don't know why. Maybe it's my room. Um, uh, who knows? Speakers, a combination, I don't know. But I usually I like it better without any of that room correction that's happening. How so? Here's what I have always believed. You, if there's problems in your room, it's okay. You can learn how to deal with them, but it takes some experience. And what that means is you have to keep on playing lots of tracks, and not your tracks, tracks that you think sound really great, and you get the highest quality ones that you can, and you play them back. And I mean, these are tracks that you know sound terrific by major artists that you really love. And you put them on and you hear what it sounds like in your room. And then you try to make your mixes sound like that. And that usually takes care of all those problems because you know what the good mixes sound like, so you're just trying to duplicate that. And if there's problems with those, you know what they are. So then you can duplicate that as well. And that's how I know most people have done it. And this is forever and ever. This is the way they've done it. Um, so, you know, that's, a tradi that, that's the traditional way to do it. You can use the software room correction. But again, the whole trick is, you got to take a lot of measurements. It does take time. It's not something you just put a, a microphone up and hit, hit go and it happens for you. Yes, you can do that. But then again, it, it doesn't really tell you that much. And you might only have one head position. As soon as you move your head one way or the other, a couple of inches, it all goes away. So that's why you have to take a lot of, of measurements to really make it worthwhile. Okay. I hope I helped you on that, Gene. <laughs> Here's one from Sydney Thurman. Is there any reason to keep the DMG disk image files? And so if there's so much software these days that is compressed into a DMG, it's basically a disk image file. It's a small file. It compresses it down so it's small. And what you do, you click on it, and then it opens up to something bigger, and you see the folder, and then you can you can then uh, you don't download the software, you insert the software, the you you apply the software. Uh, yes, you, after you've done that, that, that's just an efficient way to send it, so you don't have to sit there and wait for an hour, <laughs> or you know however long it is. Um, it's also, it's a way that you don't have to worry about any errors in transmission. Usually, um, a DMG file, a disk image file comes in, it's free from any errors, so you don't have to worry that you know you have some sort of problem in your software. Yes. Well, make a long story short, yes, you can delete it. As soon as, as you open it up, you can delete it. Now... I'm seeing more and more companies automatically delete it these days. And the first thing you do when you click it to open it up, it will ask you uh, something like, um, do you want to delete this when the install is finished? And you just say yes, and it does it for you. So I would say always do it if you can. There's no real reason to keep it. See, Jen is here from San Francisco. Hi, Jen. 
Okay, from Marty Lang. Simple question. I've recently got a good deal on a new desk for my system. My speakers are now in at the perfect height if I lay them on their side. Should the tweeters be pointing out or in? So in other words, should the tweeters be in the outside or the inside? 99% of the time, they should be on the outside. And the reason why is it will give you a wider stereo field. The only time they would be on the inside is if the speakers are really far apart. Chances are that's not going to happen in a small studio, especially if if it's built around a desk. So um, almost all the time, tweeters on the outside. Uh, From Brian, might there be a replay made available? Yes, there's always a replay. You go to the Hitmakers Club. I think I'll say Hitmakers Club Q&A, Q&A sessions uh, on your dashboard, bobbyosinski.com, bobbyosinskicourses.com. Don't forget, if you have any questions, put them in the chat and write, and I will get to them in a little bit. Okay, from Mary Allen. I'm considering the Sony MDR7506 headphones. I want flat response headphones that don't color the sound. Which headphones do you recommend? Well, I have a pair of Sony 7506s, and I've liked them, to be honest with you. I've used them a lot. Uh, I don't use them anymore because um, the ear cups wore out. I know I can buy new ones and put them on. I just haven't gotten around to it. Uh, I really like these that I'm wearing for an all-purpose, really good set of headphones. These work great. They're Audio Technica's um, ATM 50Xs. I think there's a new version, um, an XM or something like that. Uh, Honestly, you can't go wrong with them. They, They sound great, but the Sonys are cheaper. They're about 50 bucks cheaper, I think, and, and they work great. You know, it's funny because those, I think, are one of the biggest selling headphones in the world, and the as professional headphones. And the reason why is they're kind of a standard in broadcast. So if you look and you... You look for somebody that's actually out doing live sound, live meaning um, um, audio for a video on a video shoot. Usually the the sound person is wearing 7506s. But that being said, you can't go wrong with them. They're nice on your ears. They feel good, and and they sound pretty good. Um, Ron asks, uh, well, I'll get to that in a little bit. Good one, Ron. Okay, from Neil. Um, Hi, Bobby. Loving the course. I've read in other manuals that it helps the mix to work on EQ separation and mono first. Uh, So you don't lean on panning to do the job, then add the panning afterwards. Is this something you advise against? No, no, it's a good way to do it. Um, I'll give you a little anecdote. When I was co-writing the Ken Scott book, of course, the, the great engineer Ken Scott was one of the five Beatle engineers and did Bowie and super tramp and tons of others. Um, He would often not remember what happened way back in the Beatles days. And of course it's a long time ago. So 40, 50 years. So he would refer me to other people and what would keep on coming up with everybody who was there was we would spend all of our time working on the mono mix and hardly any time working on stereo. The reason why is if you get it to sound good in mono, it'll sound dynamite in stereo. So it's still the same. If you start your mix in mono and you make it sound really good, then it's going to sound wonderful when you actually do get to panning everything and put it in stereo. So uh, I would agree with that. Um, It's a good place to start not enough people listen in mono 
And I have to admit, I'm the same way. I don't listen enough. I do listen, and I make sure I always listen to mono at some point. Um, should probably listen a lot more. And, you know, it's funny. Every every mixer I talk to pretty much says the same thing. Oh, yeah, I should listen more in mono. <laughs> Andrew asks, um, how do those big major labels have their music sound so loud? Is it the gear they use, or is it because the mix is already loud to start with? My mixes, my mix loudness ranges between minus 9 and minus 12, and I can't make it louder. I've tried to make it louder, but the clipping will start to appear. Is there a secret? Yeah, there is. Okay, let's, uh, let's get to the first question. Um, how do those big major labels have their music so loud? Well, it's mixed loud, first of all. It's, and the reason why it's mixed loud, it, it, this has all changed in the last mm, five, to seven, eight years. Um, mixers re will mix it as loud as they can. And it, it used to be they didn't. They'd mix it the way they heard it, and then they would send it to mastering, and mastering would goose it up and, and make it really loud. Uh, now they mix it as loud as they can because they have clients and A&R people that are saying, uh, why isn't this as loud as whoever the competition is that particular week? So as a result, what ends up happening is they, they mix it loud. And then they send it to mastering, and master, mastering makes it louder. So that's how that all happens. Now, if you can't get your mixes to sound loud, there's a foolproof way. It oh, It's always worked. That's the way they've done it you know, from the beginning in mastering. On your mix bus, you put a compressor, then you follow it with the limiter. And it has to be a new look-ahead digital limiter with a ceiling control. That's the whole secret. You can't, like, use an 1176 limiter. That doesn't work. A mastering limiter. Let's put it like that. Just find a mastering limiter. And usually that will allow you to set it set the ceiling where it's never going to overload. So that ceiling is usually minus 0.1 dB. Might even be less, but you can be safe, you know, minus 0.1, minus 0.2, somewhere in there. And that way you can make it as loud as you want. It's never, and, and that's the peaks you're probably ha having a problem with right now. You're mixing between minus 9, minus 12, and you're still getting peaks that are overloading. That's because you don't have a limiter on. Put a limiter on, mastering limiter, and you're never going to have a problem. You can get it as loud as you want. Now, there's such a thing as too loud. If it's too loud, it will cause listener fatigue, and people just won't like the sound of it. So, you know, you have to you have to kind of gauge that. Um, <laughs> it doesn't always work. Where I go in i have friends that are top mastering engineers there's two of them right at the street from where i live and uh, i go listen to what they're doing and a lot of times they'll do one of these things i couldn't do anything with it listen to this and it looks like a two by four you know <laughs> there's no dynamics at all and they just kind of look and say I, I don't know what to do with it so these are top people so anyway uh that's one of the things to think about. Okay. From Aaron Johns. Another one from Aaron. I run into the snare, hats, and sometimes cymbals fighting for space. I'm guessing the best way to combat that is manipulation via EQ. I'm also wondering if side chaining would work well. Yeah, side chaining works, but I'll tell you what, that gets really complex. You do that stuff when nothing else works, usually, but the easiest way to do this is use a high pass filter and on things like symbols you can high pass them pretty high and it won't matter i mean you it, you know it's, they'll still sound like symbols and you'll get rid of a lot of that over uh, a lot of that um that space problem that you're having I mean, you can go up to 500 hertz. I, you know, I, I don't like to go that high, but you, you could. And it will, 
you know, still work. And it's the same with the hi hat. Boy, you can go pretty high on that, and it'll still sound good. And then it'll give you space for your snare. So high pass filter works wonders. From Gus Pappas, uh, sorry, but I need to clarify. The term mix bus has just come up for the first time. What exactly do you mean? Is it the master channel you're talking about? I can see it as master one on your fader. He's looking at one of 101 mixing tricks, I think, or the mixing primer. Uh, I'm aware that there can be more than one bus for different groups. Um, this is why I'm unsure. Okay, yeah. Um, if we go back to the analog days, your master fader, sometimes it was called master. Sometimes it was called mix. Sometimes it was called the two bus, the number two, two bus, meaning stereo bus. Sometimes it was called stereo bus. Um, mix bus usually means that that's where your final mix is coming out of. Um, when you have things like um, subgroups, those are submasters, so to speak. Not the same thing. They're all feeding into the mix bus. Now, you'll see this as bus as B-U-S and B-U-S-S. I believe it should be B-U-S-S, and the reason why is um, when I was in college, I was studying um, electronic engineering, and there are things called bus bars, and a bus bar was where how you'd ground things, and it was a B-U-S-S. It was distinctly different from B-U-S, which is a big yellow thing that's you know goes on the highway. No. Um, so that's why I always believe it should be B-U-S-S. That's the way I was taught, and I kind of believe there should be a difference. But a mixed bus is your master bus. It's a long way of saying that. Uh, okay, from KC. I love all your books. I was recently reading over the monitor placement section, Mixing Engineer's Handbook, with the equilateral triangle and listening environment. However, when I see any of my favorite, favorite mix engineers, uh, I almost never see them sitting in perfect stereo. Most of the time, their monitors are sitting on the console bridge with the tweeters at least a foot above their head. <laughs> My question is, um, uh, is it just because they're used to their speakers and know what they sound like, uh, so they don't need to be conscious of location, or is there a reason for this positioning? How do you know that that's what they're using? That's what speakers are using. Well, First of all, you have to understand that when you see pictures, the picture may be staged. So those monitors are put up for a reason, maybe because um, it's for, maybe because you want to read the logo better. <laughs> so they put them up, and then it looks like it's shooting over your head. So it could be because of that. It could be because they just don't use it. They're using other monitors you can't see. Um, in picture that, and sometimes it may be that the monitors are cantered down, so it's more at, at the mixer's ears. But for the picture, they keep it up, it just you know, reads better, looks better. So, I hope that answers that. Okay. It says he lost us. Let me just. Oh, okay. Um, don't forget, coming up, the song critique webinar. It's actually not a webinar. It's just a video. So send me links to your songs. The questions at bobbyosinski.com. And now. Um... Oh, yeah. Okay. We've got a couple more. Wow, this went on and on. Okay, from Jess Lucio, um, how do you recommend I calibrate my monitors with my interface? I use pink noise method at minus 20 and got it to where halfway of my interface's volume is pushing up 70 dB out of the speakers. I'd like this to be my regular listening level. When I play music back from a master track, I'm not hearing 70 dB. It's about 80 dB or more. Should I calibrate using a master track and separate your speakers? And when I mean calibrate, I mean calibrate level. 
you ideally want them to be the same level left and right. So that calibration, you, you want to make sure you get right. So if it's 79 on one side, it's 79 on the other. So that you'd like to have. But other than that, unless you're doing tele, television mixing or film mixing, you usually don't have to worry about this. Now, film mixing especially, because film mixing is done at 85 dB, it never changes, ever. There's no such thing as a volume control. It doesn't go up and down. 85 dB is what comes out all the time. That's what you hear in, in a motion picture theater, in a movie theater. Um, television, it's usually 79, and it's lower. And it might be 82 sometimes, but it's lower for a reason, and it's mostly because people listen lower than in their home than in a theater. So, again doesn't change for if you're mixing music i wouldn't worry about it what i would do is find a level that you're comfortable with and don't change keep it there and the reason why is as if you change your levels a lot you fool your ears and then after a while your ear doesn't know what to really listen to there's no reference point the other thing is your monitors may change the fre their frequency response at different levels. So you turn it down a few dB, and all of a sudden you, the low end is different. So the only way to get around that is I, it's really, you have to have three different levels when you're mixing music. So there's one that you're comfortable with all the time. And you just turn it up until you're comfortable with it. It feels good to you. You don't have to worry about using pink noise or any of that stuff. Then, in order to get the low end, you got to turn it up. You need some level. You need to push some air. It doesn't have to be for long. A couple minutes is fine. But you, you have to have another level that's kind of loud. Loud enough that, again, you're moving some air and, and you can hear what's happening in the low end. And then you finish it off by going as quiet as you can. So you come down to whisper level, and then that exposes any problems that you might have in balance. Things will all of a sudden jump out of the mix that didn't at your normal listening level, or they'll be, be they'll be um, they'll disappear. So that's why you want those three levels. You're right between eighty and eighty five is pretty reasonable 85 already is kind of loud so closer to 80 is usually more comfortable um one of the reasons why when you try to calibrate is uh, i don't know where you're you're introducing the pink noise and i don't know how you're playing back your master track because you may be the pink noise and the master track may be at two different places in the signal path, and that's why you have differences in volume. You really have to see how you're doing it. But, again, I wouldn't worry about it. It's not crucial to you at that level. Just find a place that feels good, and that's where you're staying most of the time. Again, you don't want to be changing up and down a lot, especially just a little up and down because that's going to be, um, you know, kind of um, counterproductive for you. Sorry, guys, if I'm dropping out. Um, I'm not sure why. Um, I'm thinking that it's an Internet problem. Uh, I see lots of questions. I'm going to get to them in a little bit. Uh, you know, this looks like f something from last time. This looks like something from the last time. But I'll answer it anyway from Colin Burns. Gary Gray says acoustic tre uh, acoustic treatment is um, all you need is 70, 50 to 70% room, non-reflective, not worry about measurements and the mirror trick, etc. I know I've written a book. Um, okay. Um, Gary's mostly right, but here's the thing. If you're going to have your room 
non-reflective, 50 to 70 percent, it doesn't take that much more effort to make it right. And what you're trying to do is provide a reflection-free zone around your, yourself on both sides and the ceiling. It really doesn't take all that much more work to do it right. So why not do it? And that's the way I look at it. Hmm. This is from the last one. So, yeah. Okay, let's get the live Q&A. Okay, I'm going to go up to the full screen here. Here we go. Let me get to your questions now. Okay, from Ron, he says, uh, what are your thoughts on Sennheiser 800s? You know, I can't tell you about the 800s. I do have a set of 650s that I use. Um, now, I can't say I use these a lot. I use them as a check on my mix. But I don't mix on them, for instance. Uh, I have them. I use them. I check. But um, And the 800s, I don't know. I heard they're great. The 650s are great. I like them too. But it's not something that I rely on to mix. Some people do. I know. But um, I don't do that. Okay, from Aaron, uh, do you ever do a live mix session for these webinars? Here's the problem, Aaron. It takes too long. Do you want to sit for five hours on a mix session with me? You'd be bored for four and a half of those. That's the problem. Doing a mix is, it, it's long. I mean, You know, it, gee, if I did five hours, that would be, really fast I mean, it's nothing to do 12 hours on a mix you spend six of those on a vocal you'd be bored to death so that's the big one of the big problems and that's why i don't do it can i do it faster well yeah but you're it's not a full mix it's not what you're looking for uh mixes take a long time and a lot of it is trial and error a lot of it is experimenting a lot of it is just um uh, trying to dial stuff up. A lot of it is, you know, you'll do it for an hour and you have to take a 10 minute break and then come back. So again, it, most of the time it's really boring and that's why I don't do it. And you don't see other people do it either. Okay. From Ray, uh, when submitting music to CD baby for release, is it best to send files at my, at minus nine luffs? Is they're just lower level? No. Just send them your CD level. Don't don't worry about less level. Unless you're sending something to a television station, you don't have to worry about LUFs. Don't worry about it. Or for a game. Sometimes, like I know Disney does everything at minus 16 LUFs. But other, and, and what they'll do is if it's uh, something for a game, or if it's something for TV, they tell you the LUFS level that they want. The LUFS level for television is usually minus 23, something like that. Um, but other than that, no. Don't just make it make it sound good because it's going to change. You send it to CD Baby, they send it out to um, Apple Music, and they change the level to minus 14. You send it to uh, or minus 16, I think. You send it to Spotify, and Spotify goes to minus 14. Some of them, they're all over the place. They all change it. So what's the point? You know, just... Um, now, I, I know where you're doing nine uh, nine luffs, but I wouldn't worry about the luffs. I would worry about the dynamic range. If you have lots of dynamic range, it's going to sound better. Uh, Aaron says... Um, would that be an adaptive limiter? Uh, oh, you're talking about the mastering limiter. It could be adaptive, adaptive, but that's not the uh, deciding factor. You want a mastering limiter that has a ceiling control on it. The ceiling control is important. The ceiling control basically means it, the level is going to stop right here, and it's never, never going to go beyond it, ever, ever, ever. And that's what stops you from having overloads and overs. And usually it's set at minus 0.1, so minus 0.2 or less. That's why there's no overs if you do it right. 
Okay. Uh, okay. Michael Jones. You mentioned before that we no longer listen to music in mono. But when you go to a shopping mall, isn't that in mono? Should we at least listen to a mix catered to both stereo mono uh, places like shopping malls? I don't think I said that. No, I think I said just the opposite. We do listen to mono sometimes. I think you have me mixed with somebody else, mixed up with somebody else. I I would always check it mono, always, every single time. You never know what will happen. You go into mono and things disappear. You go into mono and things get loud. So I would always do that. Um, now, the majority of the time we listen in stereo, but not all the time. So I don't think I ever said that, or you misinterpreted what I said. Okay, let's see. Um, I don't see any more questions. I think we're good here. So that being said, well, let me put this up. Um, thanks so much for being with me today. Thanks for all your questions. Again, you can listen to a replay. I think you're, you're going to automatically get a an email that will give you the replay link. And that replay link is different because what that's going to show you is all the chat as well. That being said, you can still listen to this. You're just going to see the picture, though. And if you just go to Q&A section on your HMC dashboard, you're going to see it. So uh, if there are no more questions, thanks very much, everybody. And uh, I hope I helped you out here. And send me your questions. Send me your songs. Send me the links to the streams of your songs for the Song Critique webinar. And... Um, any suggestions for mixing workshops or for um, deconstructed hits? Thanks, everybody.